Hi, so morning everybody. Where, um, well, it's morning here. You could be listening to this at midnight for all I know. Um, I'm just going to do one last kind of catch-all lesson, if you like, on the Chartist before we move on to looking at a sources paper on this final topic. Um, and the reason for this, I added it in, I think, a year or two ago, um, because although we'd kind of done the nature of Chartism, the key events, uh, sometimes the sources papers require a kind of depth of knowledge that's difficult for us to achieve in just our kind of two hour lessons. Fear not though, everything that I'm going to talk about in today's lesson is actually available on the inf in the information booklet that you have. So the information booklets that you've got for all of these sources topics, um, and if we were in school we kind of tend to make them all different coloured so you have a whole range of them. But uh, this particular one is Peel and Chartism. It's available on Schoology for you. Uh, there's one on the trade unions and pressure groups, for example. There's one on the factory and mine resorm reforms. There's one on every single topic for the sources. And they are a brilliant source of information. Not seen a sources paper yet in four years that uh, couldn't be done by reading and learning and understanding that booklet. So you have got that resource at your fingertips and do you know, have a have a browse, read it slowly, try and highlight key points, annotate, um, just reading on its own. It's not great, you know, it's not a way of learning really, is it? You're not really learning. But if you can kind of read it through and then relate to what we've covered in the lessons and annotate and highlight and pick out, then that's a brilliant way of learning. So um, yeah, just to kind of reassure you, it doesn't all rest solely on these lessons and you have got good resources. And of course, as we've gone through this, we've covered quite a lot of chunks of the textbook as well. So just a little reminder that you've all got a course booklet for Pitt to Peel. And I actually wrote you independent questions and tasks that would teach you the entire course. And again, if you've not got that at home, no worries, it's on Schoology. So um, that's available as well. So any of these topics that we're doing, another thing that you can do to consolidate if you wish to, or when you've got time, there's no rush for any of this, is to just make sure that, you know, as well as doing these lessons, you've worked through the, the tasks in the independent booklet. They are written to sit alongside the textbook. So you need a copy of the tasks. Some are questions, some are write a list, some are do a diagram. Um, copy of those and, and your textbook and again a brilliant way of making sure that you've really kind of taken in this part of the course but we're almost finished you'll be pleased to know so we're going to start to think about how we move on to Ireland with you we've got a cunning plan don't worry we, we think we can do it pretty well using this kind of methodology and if you've got any feedback please do email me or email Mr Thomas and let us know if if certain things work for you and certain things don't work for you please get in touch because I'm not sitting in front of a room of you so I can't tell my group will tell you to be honest even when they're sitting in front of me there's just a silence so um, it makes no difference in some ways but I'm sure some of the rest of you are very vocal um, but please I'm joking of course I do miss you all please do feel free to just get in touch and say actually yeah that that works okay for me or I prefer it when you do this or do you know what that would be really helpful and be more than happy to try and action that so do get in touch if you've got any feedback don't be shy Right, so we're going to have a look. So we are going to have a look at the leaders of the Chartist movement. We're going to have a look at the kind of results of the entire uh, Chartist movement. We're going to have a little look at the key interpretations of Chartism. Um, all of these topics we've touched on before. So this is a little extra lesson that I did last year because I just felt like my class needed to go over a few key points, and that they, you know, they they found it helpful. So I hope you will too. Um, there's not a lot of extra resources required for this one a uh, pen and a piece of paper and there's a lot of writing it's a bit of a lecture i'm sorry so you'll be pausing me constantly and just kind of jotting things down but in some ways that's easy isn't it you can kind of just sit back and listen and get your notes down and the idea is it's just supposed to plug any gaps go over a few key points and just get you feeling really confident on chartism we'll start off by looking at this cartoon that we've got in front of us i think this one's pretty straightforward really because uh, there's no complicated caption so if you think about that formula that I always use picture so P for people so we've got three different groups I think represented in this picture 
uh, see if you can work out who they are. I'm going to tell you all the answers straight away. I for items. Well, there's one big item. So why is it so big? What does that represent? Caption. Well, you've just got Parliament and Charter labelled. Um, got some people in Parliament there. Have a look at their facial expressions. That's interesting. Things in the background. Well, I don't know about you, but I can't see anything relevant in this one. Underlying attitude of the author. Whose side is he on? Cartoonist, sorry. Artist, not author. Whose side is he on? Remember what I already know. And finally explain. So pause me there. Have a little jot down. Have a little go at interpreting the cartoon. And then switch me back on and I'll explain it for you. Okay, welcome back. So we'll just talk briefly. As I say, it's one of the more straightforward cartoons, this one. So uh, groups of people, you've got uh, a group of workers struggling under the weight of their gigantic people's charter. So, uh, you know, it's on their shoulders. They're working as a team to bring it in. You can tell from the kind of tatty clothes and battered hats um, and their thinness that they're the working class. You've got the kind of fat cat industrialist sat uh, sat, no, sorry, stood. He's on the right hand side, isn't he, with his big waistcoat and his hands in his pockets and his nice riding bo boots. Uh, but he's smiling, showing a certain kind of ambivalence, neither bothered or not bothered particularly. So he's a kind of well fed middle class industrialist on the right hand side there. So his hands are in his pockets, showing that he's not involved, so to speak. Um, but neither is he a huge opponent of it. The opponents of it we can see are on the left-hand side of the picture and we've got the kind of, you know, the, the top hat wearing and wig wearing members of parliament looking absolutely horrified as this huge charter is being forced in through the door. So they're clearly very, very against the idea of chartism. The item, why is it so large? Well, of course, the reason for that is the sheer number of signatures that they got on each of the three petitions they presented to Parliament. So the high point, of course, was the middle petition of 1842, when 3.3 million people signed to say they supported the six points of the People's Charter. So the size of the petition is a reflection of the sheer numbers that supported Chartism at its height in 1842. Um, caption, well, Parliament Chartism, we've dealt with Charter, sorry, we've dealt with those already. Um, so the underlying attitude of the author seems to be fairly uh, sympathetic in some ways to the plight of the Chartists, I would suggest. Uh, making out that they are, you know, kind of in need, shown by their kind of facial expressions, uh, their, you know, their thinness and ragged clothes. So there seems to be some sympathy on the part of the illustrator here with the plight of the working class. Uh, he shows the middle class as, you know, smiling as they watch events unfold. So he's not showing the middle class as being against this. Um, and the way that the kind of upper class in Parliament have been drawn is not particularly um, you know, kind of positive, is it? It's a little bit of a negative kind of show of them. One trying to crawl out underneath the charter there. I think he's a member of the working class, actually. So there seems to be some sympathy to the Chartists, I think, underlying this cartoon. Remember what you already know. Well, we've brought in a little bit of that already, haven't we? 1842 was the high point for Chartism. It was a mass movement at certain points in its, in its history, running from 1836 to 1848. So 12 years it was a, um, an active movement. Um, and at certain points it gathered huge amounts of support. So we start with the uh, 1839 petition. It reaches its height in 1842. And even in 1848, there's still, um, you know, a march on Kennington Common in London. There's a Chartist convention. It covers the whole country, for example. So there's all sorts of things you can add in there to kind of show off your latent knowledge of Chartism. Um, and, and that's it, really. We've, do we've done our explanation of that cartoon. So not a particularly difficult one. So let's move on to our next slide. So looking at what we're doing today, what were the results of Chartism? So what was the, the nature of it? Who were the leaders and what were the results of it? Stretch and challenge for you. Can you paint Chartism as part of a much longer tradition of radical politics amongst the working class? Because in some ways, our whole course, Pit to Peel, has been about the rise in radical politics. So it starts in the 1790s with a reaction to the French Revolution. And many historians would argue it just doesn't go away. From then on, working class politics becomes something that the ruling classes are going to have to grapple with. So we see Pitt with his reign of terror 
Liverpool with his anti-radical legislation, followed, however, by a period we, we call the Liberal Tories. So after that initial suppression by Lord Liverpool, is there an attempt to kind of pander to some of the kind of demands? And then, of course, it culminates in 1832 with the granting of political reform, which benefits the middle class, thereby destroying that dangerous alliance of workers and industrialists. Um, and, you know, many people would say, well, the middle class in 1832 being largely satisfied by what they've achieved kind of disappear in some ways from kind of radical politics. And so what we see emerging from that in the 1840s, well, 1830s to 1840s, is Chartism, another political movement, but this time firmly led by the workers themselves. So many people would argue that Chartism is the first working class political movement, but its roots, I think, lie maybe 50 years earlier when we think about Pitt and the French Revolution. I've answered that for you there, haven't I? But anyway, something for you to think about in a bit more detail. Some historians would disagree with that and say that's absolute rubbish. There's too much difference in the context of those movements. Uh, but it's certainly something to consider as a historian, I think. So success criteria for today. I can explain the different interpretations of Chartism. I've come across those already, but I'm going to talk about them again. I can identify the Chartist leaders and explain their input. So yes, again, we've come across O'Connor and Lovett. But some of the other leaders hadn't really touched on. So uh, part of this lesson is to kind of plug that gap and just give you some information on them. And finally, I can explain the results of the Chartist movement. So what, what was the kind of impact of this as a movement? OK, so a little bit of background here. Um, and this goes even further back than the 1790s. The People's Charter was the foundation text for a remarkable mass movement. It was drafted to complete the work which the Magna Carta had begun. So we're not talking about a tradition that goes back to the 1790s. We're going back to 1215, folks. Now, that's real stretch and challenge, isn't it? Can you chart chartism, excuse the pun, all the way from 1215 to the 1840s? How much has this tradition of British political involvement been growing across six centuries? That should take you the rest of the day, shouldn't it? Um, so the People's Charter, just to remind it, called for all men to be able to vote. So universal male suffrage, secret polls or secret ballots, and that would get rid of, you know, intimidation, bribery, corruption, constituencies of equal sizes. Well, we're still trying to achieve that today. We've got constant new boundary commissions to redraw our constituency boundaries. Salaries for MPs, we've got that. The abolition of property qualifications to be an MP, we've got that annual parliaments still haven't achieved that one so the idea there would be a general election every single year which would make politicians much more accountable to the people that voted them in okay so a little reminder there so if you want to write any of this down as we go through just pause and then because i'll just carry on rambling basically So interpretations of Chartism, a little reminder, you've come across this before, it's not new, but I just wanted to kind of sum it up and remind you that there are interpretations of this movement. So some historians say it's all about the economy. When people are in need, when people are starving, when food prices go up and you're worried about putting food on the table, that's when you join a mass political movement. So uh, this was supported by the Reverend R.J. Stevens. We don't know much about him other than he made a speech, so showing a connection between the church and Chartism. So he made a speech in 1838, which was recorded. So obviously I mean by that written down in the Chartist newspaper, The Northern Star. And he said that Chartism was due to poverty and suffering. And the evidence that we've got to support his interpretation is that Chartism was definitely stronger in areas where industry had been going for a lot longer. So places like Stockport, for example, which were really the kind of, you know, birthplace of the kind of textile mills. Um, those places were suffering more with the advent of mechanisation because the original factories had employed um, mechanised spinning machines, but not looms. So hand loom weavers in places like Stockport were still sought after um, as part of the early industrial revolution. By the time we get to the 1830s, 1840s, the power loom has taken over and those very skilled weavers will lose their jobs or have to take a lesser job on much lower wages 
and they tend to be places where chartism is at its strongest so old areas of industrial activity really really lent themselves to chartist support the waves of Chartism also coincide with economic depression. So there's a depression from 1837 to 9. And if you think back to your study of Peel as party leader, you'll know that at that point in time, the Whigs were in power and the economy was really struggling. And it was one of the reasons that Peel was able to exploit that and gain such an impressive election victory in 1841 for the Tories because the Whigs were accused of economic mismanagement. There was a growing deficit. So you have touched on that already. But yeah, 1837 to 1839, um, the, the economy was really struggling. And when trade slumps, people are laid off or hours are reduced and therefore families are left poorer. And, and where is your next meal coming from? How are you going to pay your rent? There's no welfare state to help you. There's nothing. And so people become very frightened, very agitated. And of course, the potential is there for them to join movements like the Chartists. There's another economic depression in 1842, just as Peel's announcing his laissez-faire uh, free trade budget. Then the economy kind of picks up a little bit towards the middle of the 1840s and Chartism goes really quiet. And then from 1847 to 1848, there was a Europe-wide trade depression. This time it wasn't just Britain. And again, we get the third petition. We get another wave of Chartism. So, um, and in 1842, you might have heard of this in your reading. You might not. There was the plug plot riots where protesters, Chartist protesters, stole the plugs from factory boilers. And of course, in those days, the factories were steam powered. So without a plug, you couldn't generate the pressure to make the steam to fire the pistons in your machinery. So rather ingenious, the plug plot riots, they just went in and took the plugs out. Uh, and that brought industry temporarily in the North and Midlands or some factories. So it didn't bring the whole of industry to a halt. But some factories were, of course, brought to a halt by that. And the reason they did it, because they were protesting about the reduction in their wages. Um, and as I've said there above, in the mid 1840s, so kind of 1845, Peel was rising high on the success of his free trade budget. The country was doing well. There were plenty of jobs, plenty of shifts for everybody. There's hardly any support for Chartism at that time. And certainly if we look after 1848, you know, up to the end of our course, we start then a period of real Victorian prosperity. Wages begin to rise and they rise for, you know, over a decade. Living standards rise. And of course, there's no such thing as Chartism after 1848. So it can't be a coincidence. The periods of real Chartist activity coincide with what the economy is doing. Therefore, Chartism is an economic movement. Uh, and a quote for you there at the end, prosperity, which of course is when you're rich, you're doing well, prosperity killed off Chartism. So that's one interpretation. So if you want to sum that up in your own words, please feel free. So pause me. And I will discuss the other interpretation of Chartism on the next slide. So second interpretation, come as no surprise, is that no, it's not the economy. Chartism is about politics. It's about political consciousness in the working class. This is the first time we've seen the working class lead and create a movement of their own, which really encapsulates how they want the political uh, system to change, to reflect them and to include them. So what's the evidence? Well, it was first put forward by the historian E.P. Thompson, who's writing in the 1980s. Um, and he said, look, it's, it's the first ever working class political movement. Um, the Chartists believe that their, their economic problems, so their reduced wages or threats to their jobs, that all rose because they didn't have any representation in Parliament. They were excluded from politics. And so the Chartist belief was that if they could get it included in politics, if they could have working class MPs who would speak on their behalf, these economic problems would be sorted. Of course, they would then be on the political agenda and Parliament would pass laws to help with them. So, yes, economic factors are, are a driver, but the root of this is that the working class need political representation. It's a political movement. Uh, evidence, many of the Chartists were radical reformers long before 1838. So it's not just because there was a trade depression. 
many of the people that are working within this movement have been around. You know, Francis Place has been around for a long time. He was very important, wasn't he, in the 1832 campaign to uh, get the Great Reform Act. So we can say that many people involved in Chartism have long been reformers. The six points on the Charter uh, were not new ideas. So it's not true to say they suddenly came up with this programme in 1838 just because there was an economic slump. Uh, these ideas had been around for a long time, suggesting it was kind of part of a longer political tradition. And finally, the London Working Men's Association, abbreviated to LWMA, who started the movement, were not people who were in economic dis distress. They weren't um, handloom weavers. They were based in London for a start, so it wasn't necessarily just in northern areas. So the roots of the movement itself were in a group of skilled workers who were not in political distress, but nevertheless really wanted to promote the idea of political reform. So the roots of the movement were not economic. So the alternative interpretation. And of course, the answer, what was Chartism, lies somewhere in between the two. But as historians, your job is to think, well, I'm not completely 50% along that line. I'm 40% this, I'm 60% this because of this evidence and this evidence. So, you know, the answer is probably somewhere between the two. Your job is to work out, you know, if you've got a line with the economy, you know, economic factors on the left and political factors on the right, where do you put your dash on that line to determine what kind of a movement Chartism was? And you're not allowed to go right in the middle. So even if it's 51, 49, you've got to kind of put yourself on a little bit more on one side. Yeah, and that could be something you want to pause and just kind of stop and do that now. Because, you know, if you've got an opinion on this now, it just makes life so much easier when you get into the exam and you're faced with a question on this. You've already got a kind of point of view. So there's no right and wrong. Historians will disagree on this. Some people will say, yes, roots are in politics. And all the economy did was, uh, you know, present them with the opportunity to widen their base of support. So in which case, I'm a believer that it's largely a political movement and it just benefited from time to time from trade slumps. Other people will say, yeah, but without the need for economic change, nobody was supported the political points in the first place. So therefore, it, it, this is actually about the plight of the working class and their economic conditions. And I can link that to the poor law reform, you know, the Reform Act of 1834. Um, and, you know, again, the kind of sense that poverty was, you know, criminalised. And so therefore, Chartism kind of, you know, go, sits alongside that and is very much about the economy and about people being able to feed themselves. And the political bits were just a way of achieving that. So therefore, I sit on the other side. I think it's more to do with the economy, but the political bit kind of helpfully gave a solution to those underlying problems. So I sit on the other side. So you've got to make a decision. Which side do you look into your heart? Which side do you sit on with regard to chartism? OK, so pause me, make a decision. It might just be that you want to write it up. It might be that you want to use my idea of doing the line and putting a little dash on it. Where do you sit between economic and political? And then justify it. Why, why have you put your dash there? What was it you were thinking of? OK, so give me a pause. Do that and I'll see you on the next slide. OK, so um, there's two periods of violence, really. Um, for Chartism, because it's not generally an overtly violent movement. The first one was in Newport in 1839, which again, you might have come across, it's in the textbook, it's in the information booklet. Um, but the failure of the first petition did lead to a lot of frustration and anger. And we see it being expressed particularly in South Wales. So when we talk of Chartism being more active in the North, we also confusingly include in that areas of Wales, which again, with their coal mining communities um, and industrial communities, were areas of industry. So they were areas that were particularly impacted by kind of trade slumps. So in Newport in South Wales, there was an uprising on the 4th of November, 1839, after the rejection of the first parliament. 50 Chartists were wounded, 22 were killed. And that was because the troops were brought out, the army was brought out to um, quiet the demonstrations. Um, and as it says there, you know, that, that despite, you know, yes, OK, it was a kind of explosion of violence. So it's one of those um, things where it's, it's useful to know about it. I don't think it particularly colours 
the whole of the Chartist movement, but it's useful to know that at this one point in time, there really was bloodshed um, on behalf of Chartism. The other point at which you see kind of direct action is the plug plots in 1842, which I mentioned earlier. Okay, so it's just one of those, oh, I'll put this in to make sure they didn't miss that. There was a confrontation November 1839 in Newport. Sometimes it pops up on a cartoon. So it's, worth, it's a little bit like the kind of riot over the Stockport workhouse. It sometimes pops up on a cartoon and you would need to know the year and what it was. Okay, on to the next slide. So what were the results of Chartism? And I've got a couple of slides on this for you. So it was definitely an umbrella organisation. It wasn't just one group with a, you know, yes, they kind of all signed up to the People's Charter, but they interpreted it in different ways. They, they joined the movement for different reasons. You know, people had their own agendas in joining this. So it's, it's not just one group and there's not one leader. And as I'm going to go on to, there's, there's different strands of Chartism. So that's a, that's a part of the result of this is the kind of nature of it as a working class movement. It's not homogenous. It's a good word for you. H-O-M-O-G-E-N-O-U-S. Different people have, you know, different aims, beliefs. So the moral force Chartists emphasised non-violent protest educating the workers so they very much wanted to distribute newspapers pamphlets leaflets to educate the workers about how they could improve their position and they wanted to cooperate with the middle class and of course running alongside this because remember we're not teaching this chronologically so at the same time as chartism you've also got the anti-corn law league because they were campaigning for the repeal of the corn laws at the same time because of course the repeal of the corn laws eventually passed in 1846 which, you know, and Chartism starts in, you know, starts in earnest, shall we say, in kind of 39. So um, the Moral Falls Chartists, led by people like William Lovett, wanted to make links with Cobden and Bright and work with the ACLL. Um, so William Lovett, I've just mentioned, and Francis Place, I've mentioned as well. You'll, mention, you'll remember Place from the Great Reform Act uh, with these run on the banks. Um, Lovett got frustrated with O'Connor and left the Chartists in 1843. So after the second petition, he kind of disappeared from it. And I think Chartism did become kind of more radical after that point. The physical force Chartists supported armed struggle. So the Newport riots, 1839, that I've just mentioned, and the plug plots are a demonstration of that kind of approach that people were encouraged and incentivized to get out on the streets and wave their pitchforks or whatever weapons they could find to hand. It was very much led by Fergus O'Connor. He was an MP for County Cork in Ireland, um, but he himself remained within the law. So he was careful because obviously the consequences for him otherwise could have been transportation, for example. So he was pretty careful to kind of remain within the law, um, but he was a, a, a radical kind of firebrand leader. There were regional differences as well, as I've already mentioned. So Chartism tended to be stronger in the north in those old industrial areas. The north tended to be more um, followers of O'Connor and the physical force Chartists. And in 1845, Chartists um, led by O'Connor actually set up a cooperative land society. So this idea was that workers who found themselves out of work or at risk of lower wages could instead kind of go back to being farmers. So O'Connor bought up land and he sold it on to members of the Chartist movement. And the idea was that they would just become farmers and they would make a profit from agriculture. It didn't work <laughs> because, of course, many of them didn't have the skills to farm anymore. They'd been removed from farming for a generation or two. They didn't know how to make a big profit from the land. And also the idea of kind of going back to working with your hands and, you know, kind of farming without a, mechani a mechanised approach to it. You couldn't compete with the new commercial way of farming, which was much more profitable. They were using machinery. They were using labour um, to make money in, ag in agriculture. So the, the whole thing was a, a kind of bit crazy, a bit pie in the sky, really. Uh, so that kind of dominated Chartism in the north. In Birmingham in the Midlands, again, industrial areas, you might remember back to, I would say, one of the best school trips of all time, the Black Country Museum in year eight. Fantastic visit to an industrial museum. So I hope a few of you got the chance to go on that and remember it a little bit. So that area, you know, um, the, the Black Country, 
um, and all around the Midlands there were influenced more by middle class movements. So there was the CSU, who were the complete suffrage union. Um, so because that style of chartism focused more on the political aspects, they saw themselves as having more in common with the CSU, the complete suffrage union, who were also campaigning for the vote. Um, and also the anti Corn Law League. So in the Midlands, there was more moral false chartism um, and a desire to kind of work with the middle class was much stronger. And then finally, in Scotland, there was a third kind of strand of chartism, which was Christian chartism. And there the church got involved and, you know, the Scottish Presbyterian or Protestant church. Um, and they tended to suggest that kind of, you know, democracy was uh, desired by God and they kind of preached it to the congregation on Sundays. So it was slightly different again. So sh some shared aims and approaches, but as we said at the start, all these different strands of Chartism are working at the same time. And that means it's not a unified uh, kind of protest movement. And that means in some ways it's more difficult for it to achieve its aims. So if you want to get any of that down, please feel free to. So you need to pause me because I'm going to go on to another slide, still looking at the results of Chartism. OK, so after 1832, the political situation was pretty stable. Uh, the police force had been set up, of course, following the ideas of um, Robert Peel. He, he started the Metropolitan Police and that was extended across the whole country in 1839 with the Rural Police Act. And that meant there were police in all the localities and they, of course, could monitor the Chartists. They could swoop in and intervene if they thought that anything was getting out of hand. So mass protest became more difficult after that stage. So the government's kind of stronger after 1832. Gray has made his concessions as prime minister and that leaves him and successive governments, I think, in a stronger position because, of course, the middle class are largely content with what they've been given. They've been given the vote and that takes them out of the political equation, really. They're kind of pretty happy and they want to defend those gains. Um, there we go, going on to that point. So there's a lack of support for Chartism amongst the middle class and therefore there's a lack of support for Chartism in Parliament. Um, the physical force Chartists put them off. They were more likely to support the anti Corn Law League if they wanted to get involved in a pressure group. And most of them were quite content with the fact they'd now got the vote and they wanted to kind of sit on that and support it. They didn't want to jeopardise that by getting involved with the crazy Chartists. During the 1840s, Peel's government enacted reforms that were designed to help the working class. So that took the wind out of the sails of Chartism to some extent. So the Mines Act of 1842 coincided with the year of the second petition, for example. The repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846, two years before the third petition. Those changes did help to improve working conditions. If you remember, the Mines Act banned children and women from working underground. So in the short term, it, you know, it would have been difficult for some families economically but over the longer term morally it seems to show that the government did have some regard for the welfare of the workers albeit a small amount so there was a sense I think that the government were already acting upon some of the working class grievances and um, so chartism kind of petered out as wages and living standards grew so after 1848 we move into a real kind of golden age for the Victorian era which lasts well into the 1860s so there's, there's still agitation for parliamentary reform, but it doesn't have the same power. Sorry, guys, that slide kind of disappeared quite quickly and I'm not entirely sure how to get it back. So probably easier for you to kind of rewind slightly on the video because it was sitting on there for quite a while. OK, so the end of Chartism then. So um, we know that 1839, the rejection of the petition, the failure of the Newport riots and the bloodshed there, didn't dent support for Chartism and three years later in 1842 a second petition was presented to Parliament with 3.3 million signatures. There was a huge procession through the streets of London and it was presented to the Commons in May 1842. Um, but after 1848 Chartism was really on its last legs wasn't it um, and the last National Charters Convention was held in 1858 but it was a shadow of its former self. So that's just kind of ending the the story there. So we're going to move on to look at some of the key leaders of Chartism and this will help with the sources paper that I want to set this week. 
So I've spoken about him already. William Lovett, he starts it all, doesn't he? So he starts the London Working Men's Association in 1836 with Henry Hetherington, John Cleave and James Watson. Important to probably have a note of those names because, for example, Hetherington might pop up in a source. These are all people who wrote a lot. So that's why I kind of think it's important to have the names because if you get a piece of writing from one of these, the exam board won't expect you to know every single name, but it's kind of nice if you do. You're coming at it from a position of confidence. Ah, yes, I know him. He worked with Lovett. So I know he's a moral false chartist, for example. So it just gives you a little bit of a heads up if you've got some of these names written down in your notes. So I think it probably is helpful. Um, so William Lovett, he drafted the first People's Charter in 1838. Uh, he believed in moral force. Although there is some talk that he allegedly planned a riot in Birmingham in 1838, although it didn't take place. He was still in prison for sedition. So sedition was an old law, uh, not quite as bad as treason. But the idea is that you're kind of plotting against, not against king and country, but you're pro plotting against existing laws. Uh, so he was in prison for that in 1839. Um, became disillusioned with O'Connor and the physical force charters. He actually left in 1843. Sorry about the typo there. Uh, but it, the discontent, the murmurings of discontent uh, were emerging. There was a real personality clash between Lovett and O'Connor. They did not get on. They did not like each other. And that made it very difficult, I think, for chartism to become one unified force. So that's Lovett. So if you need to get any of that down, pause. Fergus O'Connor. So he's the firebrand Irish guy. So he's MP for County Cork from 1833, uh, loved by the working class, a real passionate speaker. He's kind of got that gift of the gab a lot of Irish men have and women. Uh, he joined the London Working Men's Association, but he wanted to kind of branch out and bring the northern areas in. So he set up the Northern Star in Leeds in 1837. That newspaper is important to know because that does come up a lot as a source, as you can imagine. He also was convicted of sedition. Um, and then released. He wrote about his ideas for a land scheme, and I've mentioned this already in this lesson, in 1843, and in 1845 he set it up. So this was the Chartists Cooperative Land Society. So it aimed to turn workers into self-sufficient farmers and move them back to the countryside, but it failed. O'Connor himself presented the third petition to Parliament. He claimed it had 5.7 million signatures, but in fact it had less than 2 million. So uh, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. He was one of those. So he, he, he was very energetic and very committed, but he did tend to divide his followers. Okay, so again, pause if you need to. I'm going on. So James Brontaire O'Brien, an intellectual and journalist. He wrote for radical newspapers like The True Sun and The Destructive. He wrote for The Northern Star from 1848 to 40. He was definitely a physical force chartist. Uh, and in 1839, he was one of the delegates or representatives that went to the People's Convention. So that was held in Birmingham, if you remember it. It's where they all got together um, and had a big meeting to talk about chartism and their ideas. He was arrested and imprisoned in 1840. And he later set up his own newspaper, The National Reformer, when he fell out with Fergus O'Connor. did say that O'Connor was quite a divisive figure. But to start with, O'Brien was, you know, one of the head honchos of the movement and was a physical force chartist. Henry Hetherington. So he's a radical working class journalist and co-founder of the London Working Men's Association, along with Lovett. He set up a newspaper, The Poor Man's Guardian, in 1831. Not to be confused with the Manchester Guardian, which had been started um, at the time of the Peterloo Massacre in 1819. Uh, he was imprisoned for publishing without paying stamp duty. So if you remember one of the six acts, that uh, Liverpool had brought out was stamp duty because he was fed up with the radical press. So uh, stamp duty is still an issue by the 1830s, 1840s, because it makes these leaflets and pamphlets too expensive for the workers to buy and read. So people like Henry Hetherington will just publish illegally. Uh, he campaigned for the Chartist in Wales and in the North, and he sided definitely with Lovett and the Moral Force Chartists. So a little bit of background on him. So pause if you need to. Next one. William Cuffey, he's an interesting one. So he's a militant, he's a Caribbean heritage, and he was the son of a freed slave. He, Cuffey was born in Kent. Uh, he became a tailor um, and got involved in the trade union movement. He actually went on strike in 1834, and he became president of the London Chartist from 1842. He supported O'Connor, he was definitely a physical force chartist. He helped to organize the third petition, and he was transported to Tasmania 
1848 for planning the Kennington Common Uprising, which was the 1848 uprising in London, although he was pardoned three years later and was able to return to the UK. So, yeah, really kind of interesting kind of heritage there and his involvement in radical politics perhaps should come as no surprise. Perhaps it does come as a surprise because of his background. OK, and Anne Knight. So I, I didn't want to kind of let this go without kind of showing that, yeah, women were involved in this. So she was an advocate of votes for women. She objected to the term universal suffrage because it wasn't universal, of course. It was male suffrage. She wanted votes for women put into the People's Charter of 1839. She was also a vocal campaigner for the abolition of slavery uh, and she had many letters published. So again, she might come up because you could get one of her letters as a source. So I don't think that they wouldn't expect you to know who she was. She's not on the syllabus, but it's kind of nice to feel that you're a bit ahead of the game. So, yeah, Anne Knight, kind of interesting because I kind of figured doing my research on this that she was probably the most likely female source that you could come across. So I thought it was kind of worth knowing a little bit about her. OK, moving. Finally, Tom, it's finally, Thomas Atwood, he, you've come across him before, so I haven't written a lot down about him because, of course, he was more um, known as a member of the campaign for the Great Reform Act in 1832. So he's an MP for Birmingham. He has been for a long time. Um, and because of the fact he was a sitting MP, O'Connor was no longer MP for Cork by 1839. So Atwood was approached and he agreed that he would present the first petition to Parliament. Um, but he wasn't really committed to the idea of universal suffrage. He was more of a middle class campaigner. So, yes, he led the Birmingham Political Union, but he was one of those middle class. He kind of wanted the numeric power of the workers without really wanting everybody to get the vote. So he wasn't entirely committed to the idea of further political reform. Uh, and he left the Chartists in 1840 after the first uh, petition. Henry Vincent. Oh, there's another one. So he was a Chartist MP seven times, but was unsuccessful. He couldn't have afforded to do the job anyway because he had to work. Uh, so he's a printer and journalist writing about workers' rights. Um, and he was the reason there was a riot in Newport in 1839. So uh, it was Henry Vincent who'd been imprisoned in Newport jail for making a, what they said was a seditious speech, a, a speech that kind of threatened the laws of the country. So they'd thrown Henry Vincent into jail. And the reason that the, you know, kind of scuffle ensued was because the charters were trying to get him freed. So that's his claim to fame. So again, if you come across his name, that's why he's, he's famous. OK, so our little review then for today. Uh, what was the nature of charters and what are the results of chartism? You should hopefully feel really quite confident on that now. So success criteria, I can explain interpretations of chartism. Well, I can. So how much did you engage? Did you get some notes on that? Did you make up your own mind about economic versus political? I can identify chartist leaders and explain their input. Well, that's what we've just done. So if you made a note for each of those slides, even if it was just a little subheading with the name and one fact, you should be able to do that. And I can explain the results of the Chartist movement. Well, they didn't achieve a lot, really, did they? Um, but as we've said, part of the problem with all of that was they were split. Uh, the government was in a strong position. So we went through a lot of kind of, you know, kind of factors that impacted on the Chartists. So hopefully you're feeling reasonably confident on that as well. So what I'm going to do is set up the next lesson will be to kind of set up a sources paper. And I'm going to give you the 2017 sources paper on Chartism. Uh, it's quite a, quite a tough one. But I'm going to talk you through it and we'll we'll get you feeling like really confident and prepared. Um, and that will be our final sources paper for the time being. Um, who knows what's going to happen in the next half term? Um, I hope, you know, we're hoping that we will be able to see you um, in some format. I doubt it's going to be that we all come in and sit in our original groups. But um, we, we're hoping that you, we definitely will have contact with all of you face to face um, before too long which would be brilliant um so i'm going to set that up you're going to do that sources paper and that finishes the course essentially we're done which is fantastic because we're bang on track for where we should have been at this time so a huge pat on the back and well done if you've been keeping up with these lessons um really really proud of you for kind of doing all of this at home and kind of getting on independently i know it's not been easy so well done for hanging on in there 
So um, that will mean you've done at least three sources papers as practice. Obviously, you've done a whole range of essays on this. Um, so what I will suggest on Go for Schools is that sometime um, over the next kind of, you know, few weeks, it would be a really, really good idea to make sure that all your notes for this are in order, in topic order, that you have finished off all of the independent questions that are in your course booklet. Now, if you haven't started them and that just feels like, oh, my God, um, my, my, my group are being nagged on that since September. So hopefully it won't seem like such an ordeal. But, you know, ra you know if, if that is just not doable, then perhaps you could look at those and have a go at the questions that you definitely couldn't answer. <laughs> So if you if you look at the question and think, well, I kind of already know the answer to that. OK, fine. Ignore it. It's not an important one for you. But if you look at a question and think, oh, I, I can't do that, then that would be a good time to get the textbook out and make sure you've plugged those gaps. So a little bit of kind of self-assessment and working through. I'll pop it on Go for Schools for you so that you've got that as a, as a task. So that would be really useful. I know Mr. Thomas is always really keen on getting his group to kind of write their revision notes ready. And there's no harm in doing that, is there? So kind of just take each topic at a time um, and kind of start the process of maybe doing some flashcards, etc. Because, of course, if we had been in school, you would have done that because you would have had a mock exam. <laughs> um, so we ha you haven't done it because obviously you've been having to work at home. But in order to kind of give yourselves that helping hand next year so that next year doesn't feel quite such a fright, that would be a really, really good thing to do. And it's not urgent, but certainly perhaps between now and the summer holidays, it would be a good idea, you know, once you've got all these lessons and notes done to think, oh, I could do some revision um, notes as well, be it flashcards, mind maps, you know, whatever you like doing for revision. Um, so that would be helpful too. So there's lots and lots of kind of little things that you can just kind of do now just to brush everything up. And, you know, when you finally close that pit to peel folder, you've got that sense of confidence and satisfaction of, you know, a job well done, a course really thoroughly learned. And I'm on this. I can't I get it. Um, and that would be really, really good. So, um, yeah, good luck with all of that. And I'll be in touch. I'll, I'll put the next lesson up earlier rather than later this week so that you've got the chance to kind of prep that sources paper, um, you know, in, in good time. Okay, over and out, everybody.